Have you ever watched world-class athletes and wonder how they do it? What makes it possible for a marathon runner to make it up that hill 22 miles into a race? Or a cyclist to move ahead of the pack and sprint after a grueling 200-mile race? Or a long-distance swimmer battling both fatigue and powerful ocean currents? Do they have something in them that's superhuman, something most of us can never realize? Or is it something else at play, something that any of us could access? We're going to go into the mind of what's such performer today, world-class cyclist Anne-Marie Miller. Anne-Marie has won the UCII World Masters Championship twice and is an 11-time U.S. National Masters Champion. She's going to tell us what she does to give herself an edge over her competitors. And why is this important to you? Well, the techniques that make her a world champion and successful training and performance coach can make you a superstar in your field as well and give you a leg up on achieving the success you want. Welcome to the Dream Power Show, Anne-Marie. Hi, Deb. How are you today? Oh, wonderful. Well, Anne-Marie, when I was a little girl, I would race around the block with my friends on my bike, trying to see who could race the fastest. Now, my racing days didn't last very long because most of the kids were older and had better bikes, and I didn't usually win, so I lost interest. Did you have racing in mind the first time you got on a bicycle as a kid? Not really. I think as a kid, I more or less used it as kind of a little uh, sort of escape to just ride around our farm on the driveways and lanes and uh, just kind of keep moving. I, I was always someone who was always in motion in one way or another. And the bike was a lot of fun to be able to get and roll and, and you could go fast. Uh, so it gave you a feeling of freedom and, you know, a sense of, of being able to kind of chart your own course. So what made you decide to go into competitive racing? Well, I, I took a very roundabout way to get into competitive racing, to be honest with you. <clears throat> I had been more or less a runner uh, for most of my life, although I had been on my sorority bike team in college at a relay race that was held at Ball State University called Sigma Switch. <clears throat> but I, I always had a bike and I would use it mostly for commuting and riding around and you know getting from one place to another. And um, I was doing a lot of running races at that time and I was working in a corporate fitness center and one of my colleagues said, oh, well, you run and you ride a bike, you ought to do duathlons. And I really didn't know what a duathlon was. It's a bike, it's a, a race event that consists of a run leg, a bike leg, and then another run leg. So I thought, well, hey, I do those things. Great, let me try it. And um, I entered my first duathlon in New York City and actually ended up second place out of all the women. So I thought, hey, this, is, this could be fun. And I did a lot of duathlons because I enjoyed both running and cycling. And then I started getting more and more interested in cycling. And I just felt like, well, I'm doing this, but I don't really know that much about it. I just want to be a better cyclist. Uh, so first I joined New York Cycle Club uh, because they had a great uh, training program. It was a 12 week program where they helped riders build endurance to go from riding 40 miles to completing a century ride, which is hundred miles. And they also taught good group riding skills and bike handling skills. And um, I got very involved in that and then was a, a ride leader for that group for three years. And I never really thought much about racing bikes because it always looked a little intimidating um, to have 60 people packed into a roadway and going at high speeds. Um, but I kind of overheard some friends of mine mention that their bike handling skills really improved when they started racing. So I thought, well, you know, I've taken the recreational cycling about as far as it can, I can go. I'm having a great time, but, I, you know, I would like to try and improve my skills. So I had no illusions about racing. I just started racing in order to be a better rider because I enjoyed cycling and I just wanted to get the most out of it. So I rather naively entered a bike race and actually ended up winning it and did not even realize I had won my division in that race. Uh, the first race I, the first really open USA cycling race I ever entered. Um, and from then on, I was really hooked and really <clears throat> sought to, you know, improve my uh, racing skills and become more fit and just learn more about it. So um, I got very involved and uh, eventually progressed to the point where now I'm a USA cycling level two licensed coach. And I also have my uh, bike fitter certification from specialized bicycle components. And, uh, you know, I, and besides being involved in the fitness industry, um, I'm doing a lot of cycle coaching and multi-sport coaching. 
But why long distance cycling? I mean, it's very grueling and, and you have to face all kinds of obstacles when you're doing it. Well, that's true. And even as we went through, you know, the first time I trained to do a sensory ride and each ride got progressively longer. And uh, at first it seems kind of intimidating and you, you think, well, how could I ever ride more than 40 miles? But you realize it's just one pedal stroke at a time. And the main thing is prepare yourself. If you build up gradually and take the time to build the endurance uh, and also take the time to understand how you're going to have to fuel your body for these longer events and eat smart, uh, both before the race and also during the race and after, then, you know, it, you can have fun. It can be a really successful experience. If you're unprepared or if you don't plan ahead or you kind of become forgetful, one of the worst things you can do is actually bonk during a race, which it's uh, similar to a marathon runner hitting the wall. When you simply run out of your uh, glucose and glycogen stores and there, there's nothing in the tank and you cannot go very far when you have no fuel. Think of your car. Uh, so absolutely. Uh, yeah. So Pat, tell me, how do you prepare to race? A, a long race like that. Well, a long race like that, hopefully I've done the training ahead of time. You know, it takes more than a week, more than a couple of weeks. You know, you want to give yourself enough window of time to really build the endurance so you can comfortably handle long distance rides. And, and long distance could be anything from something what the, like what we call a metric century, 62.1 miles, which is a popular distance, or all the way up to a, a century, 100 miles, or there are even now longer races, sort of um, gravel races that often are 200 miles long or more. Um, and for those, you know, again, give yourself enough window of time to adequately prepare. So you, you build week by week in the volume of training you're doing. And um, then as you approach the event, you don't want to be riding 100 miles the day before you do a century ride. So you have to give yourself enough time to actually taper before the race. But it's similar to in a marathon tapering where you once you've built up to a point where you can run 20 miles, then you actually start tapering and cutting your mileage for the last two or three weeks so that you still have the endurance space, but you're fresh and your, your muscles, uh, will, you'll have more of a chance to actually store muscle glycogen in your muscles if you're not overusing your muscles on a daily basis and depleting them daily. So you want to build up those glycogen stores. You want to give yourself time to taper uh, and not just for nutritional reasons or for musculoskeletal reasons, but also kind of as a mental uh, trick, because if you start tapering, you know, you're training less and you've been used to training at a higher volume. So mentally, uh, it really makes you want to get out there and do the long event instead of dreading it. You know, you feel like, oh, you, in fact, a lot of people suffer kind of guilt when they taper. And it's very hard when I work with athletes, it's very hard to get them to taper properly because they feel guilty not doing the same volume of training that they were doing. They feel like, oh, I'm going to lose all my fitness. And, you know, I tell people it takes, you know, you're not going to lose your fitness overnight. You're not going to lose your fitness in a few days but you are going to refresh your body and give yourself um, a head start. You're going to give yourself more of an advantage by tapering and resting properly. Yeah, I know it sort of sounds counterintuitive. You would think that, you know, to increase endurance, you need to go more, 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 more. So it is, it does sound a little uh, unexpected, but I guess that's what makes it work. Right. Yeah. It's, there's a whole science of, peaking your training and then tapering your training in order to really perform at your best for a key event or some special long ride or race. Right. And uh, so the preparation also includes prep proper nutrition. So if you go into a little bit about uh, the kinds of food you eat, the kinds of food you avoid and that sort of thing. Oh, great. Yeah. I mean, I think basically on a, a week in week out basis, I just try to eat a well-balanced, healthy diet. I don't go in for a lot of special supplements or, uh, you know, taking taking pills to get my nutrients. I really think that the, the body is designed to absorb nutrients most efficiently from a food source. So I try to eat a nice, well-rounded diet. But as you do increase your training, you will have to increase your car both your total caloric intake 
and also your carbohydrate consumption, because basically the body can really uh, only use two, two fuel substrates for energy production. One is fats. And thankfully, we all have a pretty much unlimited supply of fats in our body. The average person is definitely has stores of over 100,000, 200,000 calories worth of fat. So you, you would think, oh, you're never going to run out of energy. You're never going to be hungry. But the problem is fat can only be burned in the flame of glucose, which means you still have to have some carbohydrates in your system in order to be able to access fat for energy production. Uh, so it is important to have enough carbohydrates and especially the higher intensity that you're going to be performing, uh, the more that you your body relies on carbohydrate sources for energy production. It, your body is very comfortable using fat when you're at rest or at lower and lower intensity levels. But once you re reach a certain critical point where you go above that metabolic set point where your body shifts from burning primarily fats for fuel to burning primarily carbohydrates, then you're going to start burning through carbohydrates much faster than you burn through fats. And unfortunately, while I mentioned you have over 100,000 calories of fat stored in your body, the body can only store about 1,500 calories at the most of carbohydrates and then probably add another 250 or so calories for blood glucose that's always circulating if, as long as you provide more um, carbohydrates in your bloodstream. So we really have a rather limited amount of carbohydrate storage. And that's why it is so important to keep um, eating and drinking during long events uh, in order to maintain a steady supply of carbohydrates so that you can continue to uh, enjoy your sport. Yeah, I want to get back to the actual racing itself, because often in races, uh, you find yourself facing an unexpected situation. Uh, how do you handle that? And could you give me an example of, or two of how you overcame what could have been setbacks that could have destroyed your whole entire race? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, well, of course, one thing that you always uh, want to be careful of is obviously you don't want to crash and, you know, injure yourself or uh wreck your bike so that it is no longer functioning uh, but everybody from time to time will have you know some sort of little fender bender on the bike or some sort of little uh crash or some sort of, sort of little incident but the one thing is to kind of learn to handle yourself while you're riding with others so that if you do make contact with another rider it doesn't have to result in a crash or uh, an accident. Um, in fact, that's one of the things that we work on with newer racers is we make them go through certain bike handling skills training so that they know what to do if they if their front wheel touches the wheel of another biker or if they accidentally bump into another rider. Uh, in one race in particular, um, it was early in the race, it was the Grant's Tomb Criterium, which is a race uh, a criterium race is a race where you cover a very short course, like you go around and around and around the town square, or a course that's usually less than two, between one kilometer and two miles long, and you do many repeated loops of that course. So as the name implies, Grant's Tomb Criterium is sort of like the joke, who's buried in Grant's Tomb, it's held at Grant's Tomb. And we ride around and around and around and around the square that Grant's Tomb is located on. And um, I had done fairly well in that race from time to time. Uh, but in this particular race, uh, as we, I was rounding a corner, I bumped into one of the other riders who was really, really good criterion rider. But she was experienced, I was experienced, and we both kind of <laughs> laughed it off and, you know, there's no harm, no foul, and continued the race, where if I had let that upset me and throw me, I would have not, I would not have been ready for what um, came up about the next lap, which was some, a woman attacked, and I didn't recognize her. It turned out she was a top collegiate racer who was on a pro team and was participating in the Grand Student Criterium that year. But she attacked out of the field, and I just instinctively jumped on her wheel and chased after her. And um, I just about busted a lung, working my way up to her. And by the time I caught up to her, I was, I was totally out of breath and completely gassed and spent about a half a lap just trying to stay with her. And then we started working together, and we were working together so well that we started increasing the distance between us and the rest of the field and um with about five laps to go i realized i don't think the field is going to be able to make up the distance now we were about in fact we were about ready to lap the field at that point 
And I thought, there's no way the field is going to catch us. And at this point, they had all lost interest in wasting energy chasing the first two riders because that meant someone was really going to have to do a lot of work. And the rest of the riders, their mindset is, well, I'm just going to sit back and wait for the sprint. So I stayed with this woman. And um, on the last lap, I thought, oh, this is great. I could get second place in this race. And as we were coming around the final turn and heading toward the finish line, I thought, she's not going that fast. So I just stood up and sprinted and roared past her and much to, you know, won the race, um, much to my surprise. And like I say, if I had let that first little incident throw me or, you know, put me in some kind of a negative mind state, I know I wouldn't have been, you know, had the calmness and, and the ability to, you know, I would, I don't think I would, I think I would have been afraid to try to respond to her attack. But, you know, I just kept going, you know, there's one little incident, not a big deal. Keep going. Well, and uh, for those listening on the podcast who can't see you, uh, I have to say that you're not a little kid and yet you race against collegians and win. How do you do that? Well, I think the main thing is just to be in the moment, to be as well prepared as you can be. Uh, you know, I, I try to, to build my fitness up to the, the most I can. And um, you really have to, especially in a sport like bike racing, uh, a lot of times the result is more dependent on when you play your card and um, knowing your strengths so that you play your card at the right time. And um, I think that I, I'm good at, you have to stay in the moment. Uh, I think many people get way ahead of themselves and write a big script about what they're going to do in a race situation, but you really have to be so totally in the moment that you really sense what the rest of the group is doing as, as a big organism or something, and you feel what's going on in the group. There have been many times when I've won races in rather uncanny situations where I just since that moment where everybody else was sitting up and looking at each other and saying to themselves, I don't want to go to the front and work. Let her go to the front. No, not me. I'm not, I'm not going to the front. Let that person go to the front. And when I see that kind of hesitation, and I know people are trying to size each other up, a little voice often comes on in me and just says, got to go. And I listen. And when I listen to that voice, if I'm in good shape and I can follow through on it, it gives you just enough of an advantage that other people then are kind of left startled and it will take them another couple of seconds to react. And by the time they've reacted, you've been able to establish, you know, an advantage over the rest of the group. So I think much of, you know, being successful and the same way tennis players or anybody else, you have to know when to hit the drop shot to catch your opponent off guard, or you have to know when to hit the lob that'll take them kind of out of position so that you can set yourself up for, you know, a, a real smash hit. Um, and I think that part of it is just trusting yourself in the moment to know, and also uh, to know, to look at the course, if you know anything about the course that you're racing on, to kind of pick spots where you feel like you would have the best chance to uh, establish a breakaway or where you would have the best chance to launch your sprint. Yeah. Uh, you know, so many times we talk about being in the zone, you know, having that singular focus and mindset, which is actually where we're operating on a, a different brainway level than we'd normally do. So would you say that you're in the zone when you're racing? When I've, when I've, you know, had those kind of, when I have listened to the little voice and I don't censor it, yes, I'm definitely in the zone. I just go, it's like a visceral reaction. When I try to intellectualize about stuff, and that's when it always invariably will get me in trouble. You know, if I look over at someone and um, they, you know, I don't know them or something, and I kind of think, ah, well, don't worry, we don't need to chase that person, we'll catch her on the hill. Those are the times when I, realized that was a real mistake. You should have just gone with your instinct, which was uh, follow that person when they attack. Uh, so many times that, so I find that trying not to be intellectual about it and, or to overthink, but just really be in the moment, exactly be in the flow, try, you know, if nothing else, if, as long as you try, you may be surprised at the result. You may be happily surprised at the result. 
And, and if you don't try, then you, you sort of, uh, you never give yourself a chance to see what you could do. So in other words, trust your gut. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Uh, so you're talking about this whole mindset that you have for racing. Do you find that this helps you deal with obstacles in other areas of your life? Yes, I think so. I think, um, you know, learning to be calm and to, uh, you know, approach situations with a sense of, you know, taking, taking everything in, looking at the big picture and figuring out what to do, um, it, it, it's very helpful. And I think also being able to sort of read, read, the, read the race, read the room and see what's going on so that you know how to act or when to um, make your play. I, I think in that respect, it certainly does. And I think also just that aspect of once in a while you get in a situation, I haven't spoken much about this yet, where yes, you're in a, a long race or you're especially climbing a long hill and it just, it doesn't get any easier. <laughs> Let's put it that way. And you just kind of have to keep saying to yourself, one pedal stroke at a time, one pedal stroke at a time, because you can just keep going that one more pedal stroke, you know, you might be able to hang on and um, persevere and succeed where others might give up to some extent and slow down, uh, you know, or not keep up that kind of effort. So sometimes it's just a matter of, okay, you know, let me try this one more pedal stroke. If I can do one, one more pedal stroke, maybe I can do another one. Maybe I can do another one. Mm -hmm. uh, how many races do you race each year? Well, it, it depends. In the past couple of years, unfortunately, there haven't been many races due to the pandemic. But before that, I was racing probably anywhere from 40 to 50, 60 races, you know, in a, if, in a really busy year. Usually right. you have Quite a lot. <laughs> yeah. In many cases, you have opportunities to race at least once a weekend or sometimes on Saturday and Sunday. And I've also entered a lot of stage races, which are multi-day events that consist of different ev events each day. And I love stage racing because, uh, <clears throat> you know, then you get to do different courses and different types of racing all in the same event. So I think stage racing is probably my favorite uh, type of event to participate in. And do you race only against women or do you race against men also? Well, in USA Cycling and Master Cycling, you only compete against other women. Uh, so if, in that respect, for most racing, we only compete against women. But there are other events like Grand Fondos, where even though men and women may be placed separately, you everybody starts together. And so you may find yourself in a group, a mixed group of men and women. Um, so, yeah, but and they don't really... Uh, place you against the men other than just perhaps in the overall results of the entire event uh, each age group and each sex has you know they're given separate categories in those kind of races do you ever find yourself out racing the men yes yes and there was one race where uh the promoter combined a men's master's field uh, i think a master's 55 plus with the with the advanced women's field the women category one two and the men were very upset about this. They were like, well, the women are just going to slow us down. And somehow, as it turned out at that race, the women finished ahead of the men. I was in, I happened to win that one, but I was in the lead group of women. And somewhere along the way, we dropped the men. Um, so, you know, they were complaining that they, they thought they were going to be stuck racing with women. And surprise, surprise, we happened to perform better than they did that day. That doesn't happen often, but, you know, it was, it was kind of gratifying, especially because they had obviously seemed a little annoyed at the fact they were going to have to race with women. Yeah, well, I don't find it too surprising, though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, are there times when, let's say, you get injured or you fall off the bike during a race that, that you feel like giving up? And if so, how do you get out of that mindset to continue? Um, well, yeah, I mean, I, fortunately, most of the times, um, if I've had injuries or, you know, had some kind of a minor crash, it's been minor, like, you know, just pick myself up, make sure the bike's okay, get back on the bike and continue. But I have had some serious injuries 
Um, and in that case, in some of them really were pretty serious injuries and I had to spend months recovering and even wondering, hey, will I be able to ride again? But I, you know, I just look at it very philosophically from a, you know, take it day by day. Your job, if you are injured or if you get sick or something happens that you have to, you know, pull out of your sport or any activity for a while to recover from something. And it could even be some other physical ailment that has nothing to do with your sport. But if you have to take some time off to recover, just look at it, look at it as recovery and, and, you know, getting back your strength and your health is your first job. You know, that's your first priority. So just look at it that way. Don't get ahead of yourself. Just take care of yourself right then and there. If that means more rest initially, if that means, you know, a certain recovery period or some kind of treatment, you know, be it, a, you know, treatment from a doctor or surgery, whatever, you know, give yourself that time. And then if you are injured badly enough that, you know, that you, it, you do have to recover, get yourself a really good team. Choose your doctors even carefully. If you have a choice, make sure that they're going to be on the same page as you and, and you, they understand, especially if you want to get back to your activities, um, that this is important to you. And it's not just enough that a bone heals, or it's not just enough that, oh, you recover from a, a sprain or something, but that they understand you want to get back and you want to make sure you're at the top of your game as a result of it. And even things like physical therapists, um, when I have had injuries that were really serious, uh, the physical therapy team that I had was incredible. And even noticed that I was in one incident, I was making progress ahead of what the doctor had expected. And the physical therapist asked me, do you mind if I approach your doctor because he goes, you're already exceeding his predictions for what you you can do, uh, what your capabilities are, what your range of motion is. Uh, do you mind if I approach him to see if I can give you some more advanced exercises? And I was like, hey, certainly, that's great. And uh, the doctor was actually glad to hear this from the physical therapist. So they, they really, you know, weren't afraid to try to cooperate as a team and, and make sure that I was, you know, returned, you know, and, and was able to uh, get back on my feet and and get be better than ever but it was a very you know several months of recovery several months of physical therapy and then getting back to riding and um so you know it was a long process but once and then of course once you do get back to riding you think oh am i am i going to be able to ride the way i did before am i going to have any um you know doubts but you get back to it and you just like i say focus on the moment Focus on what you're doing right then. Do everything you can to perform your best and be safe and, uh, you know, avoid being reckless or anything. And um, it, it all, it, it really uh, works out pretty well. Yeah, it's just like getting back on a bicycle, right? <laughs> it is just like, mm -hmm. How long do you see yourself continuing to race competitively? <laughs> That's a good question. Um I think, you know, I will continue to race and ride as long as I'm enjoying it and as long as I can. One of the most, one of the things that really inspired me so much uh, was when I went to Masters Worlds in Albi, France in 2017, and I won the road race that year and got the bronze medal in the time trial. And um, for, they were having the presentation of the medals for the road race on the final day of the, of the event. And they also wanted to introduce a special guest at this program, which was a man named Robert Marchand, who was 106 years old. And he had just set the world age group record for the 105 year old age group for the one hour record, which one hour record in cycling is um, go riding on a track of velodrome uh, as far as you can in one hour. Now, God bless him, this Robert Marchand was a French man. And um, so they, he won, he actually had been the 100 year old record holder for the hour. And then he turned 105 and he said, can I compete for the 105 year old title? And the International Cycling Union simply said, we've never had anybody 105 <laughs> to compete before. And, you know, God bless him. He rode around the velodrome, his our record time for the 105 year old category was 13, I think 0.8 miles. By contrast, the you know elite professional cyclists world hour record is about 35 miles in one hour. But you know, 
the elite professional is not 106 years old, but I had the honor of meeting this man. And um, he came backstage where we were all waiting to receive our medals. And he was going around shaking people's hand and, you know, saying hello. And then I saw him after the event, he was sitting outside with um, someone who was kind of care taking care of him. And I asked him for a picture. And to me, that was so inspiring to see someone who was 106 and still riding. Now, hey, if I get that far, I would be thrilled. But, you know, I can, I'm going to continue riding and, and racing and training and sharing fitness with other people, you know, as long as I can. Wonderful. Anne-Marie, how can people find out more about you and your work? Well, I have my own coaching business called Epic Training and Fitness, and my website is www.epictrainingandfitness.com. Um, and um, I am a USA Cycling Level 2 licensed coach, so if you go on the USA Cycling website you can look up uh, the directory of coaches and I am listed there um, and if you happen to be in New York City you know and you want to say hello you know contact reach out through my website and uh, I'd be happy to say hello or meet meet anybody go for a ride we've been speaking about success with award-winning racer and cycling coach Anne Marie Miller I hope you've enjoyed today's program if so, please hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on any future episodes. Until next time, this is Debbie Spector-Weissman saying, sweet dreams, everybody. <laughs>